What is up, Ewu crew? Today we are going to be covering some of the world's youngest killers. If you enjoy true crime, mysteries, and true stories, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. Now, let's get into it. The first story we are going to be covering today is that of 12-year-old Jasmine Richardson. Jasmine was born and raised in Medicine Hat, Alberta, Canada, and was the eldest daughter to her parents, Mark and Deborah Richardson. Jasmine's childhood was not particularly noteworthy, and she appeared to live contentedly with her parents and her younger brother, Tyler. However, everything changed when Jasmine became a preteen. Unlike most 12-year-old girls in the Richardson's neighborhood, who were obsessed with the color pink and spending time with their friends, Jasmine found that she much preferred the darker aspects of life. In fact, she considered herself to be rather edgy and was determined to go against all of her parents' wishes, no matter what they were. So, when a 23-year-old man named Jeremy Steinke started to express an interest in her after meeting at a punk rock show in 2006, Jasmine failed to see what was so wrong about his attention. Since Jasmine was so young, Jeremy found it easy to manipulate her in all of the ways he wished to. According to Jasmine's friends, Jeremy originally told Jasmine that he was, quote, a 300-year-old vampire who liked the taste of blood and wore a small vial of blood around his neck at all times. Jasmine and Jeremy both frequented a website called VampireFreaks.com and usually communicated with each other via a website called Nexopia, which was commonly used amongst Canada's youth. Jasmine and Jeremy hit it off right away. Jasmine soon claimed to have fallen in love with him despite their age gap. Unfortunately for Jasmine, her parents were not as excited as she was when they discovered the secret relationship between a 23-year-old and their 12-year-old daughter. In fact, they were understandably furious and horrified. They told Jasmine that she needed to stay far away from Jeremy for her own good. Unfortunately, Jeremy was incredibly persistent and didn't care what Jasmine's parents thought about his relationship with Jasmine. Jeremy told Jasmine that her parents were the only thing preventing the two of them from being together and being in love. Jasmine, who was head over heels for Jeremy, completely agreed with him and understood that the only way they could stay together would be if her parents left the two of them alone. Jeremy and Jasmine did most of their communication online after Jasmine's parents discovered their relationship. In their online discourse, Jeremy wrote a message to Jasmine stating, quote, I have this plan. It begins with me killing them and ends with me living with you. As grave as that message sounds, it got even worse. On a Windows Live Spaces account that Jeremy had, he wrote, quote, Payment. My lover's rents are totally unfair. They say that they really care. They don't know what is going on, they just assume. As their greed continues to consume, she is slowly going insane. She continues to think that I came into her life to help her out and to stop what they keep trying to shout. It's all total Their throats I want to slit. They will regret that they have done, especially when I see to it that they are gone. They shall pay for their insolence. Finally, there shall be silence. Their blood shall be payment. And Jeremy was determined for payment to come. On April 22, 2006, Jeremy, Jasmine, and a few of their friends watched the movie Natural Born Killers a film about two young lovers who go on an extremely violent killing spree for fun. After the movie, Jeremy told Jasmine and their friends that he believed that the two of them should indulge in their own killing spree in the same manner as the film. Only this time, they would spare no one. 
Jasmine appeared angry with the world, but mostly with her parents and their attempts to keep her from Jeremy. With Jeremy's constant influence, Jasmine became convinced that her parents were more than a problem in her life. They were the greatest obstacle between her and her happiness. She too was determined to make them pay for it. On the fateful evening of April 22nd, around 1 a.m., Jasmine and Jeremy decided that the time was right, and they struck. Jeremy was the first to make a move when he attacked Mr. and Mrs. Richardson on the ground floor of the Richardson's home, where he stabbed them both to death. Around the same time, Jasmine located her eight-year-old brother in his bedroom and stabbed him repeatedly in the chest. After ensuring that her parents were dead, Jeremy met Jasmine upstairs, where he then slit her brother's throat. Jasmine told him that it would have been cruel to leave her brother Tyler without any parents to look after him. The couple quickly fled from the crime scene and headed to a nearby restaurant where, not even two hours after brutally murdering Jasmine's entire family, they found themselves in an intimate, romantic embrace. Laughing and kissing, the two seemed to have no remorse about what they had done, despite having literal blood on their hands. The following afternoon, around 1 p.m., Mark and Deborah Richardson's bodies were discovered, stowed away in their family basement, and the body of poor eight-year-old Tyler was found in his bedroom. When officials first discovered the bodies of three of the four Richardsons, they were immediately concerned that Jasmine, who was unaccounted for, had also been a victim of the perpetrator who had wiped out the entire family. They were shocked to find out just how wrong they were. On April 24, 2006, investigators located Jasmine and Jeremy in Leader, Saskatchewan, a little under 81 miles away from the crime scene. Both Jasmine and Jeremy were arrested for the murders of Mark, Deborah, and Tyler and taken into custody immediately. There, Jeremy accidentally admitted to the murder of Jasmine's parents while speaking to an undercover police officer. In fact, Jeremy even asked the undercover officer if he had ever seen the movie Natural Born Killers, noting that he thought it was the, quote, best love story of all time. In 2007, when Jasmine was 14 years old, she went on trial for the murder of her parents and her younger brother. At trial, Jasmine pled not guilty to all three counts of first-degree murder. But by July of that same year, the jury decided that Jasmine was guilty on all three counts. At Jeremy's trial in November of 2008, he was also found guilty of first-degree murder for all three counts. Jeremy was sentenced to three life sentences with possibility of parole after serving 25 years. Because Jasmine had been a minor at the time of her crimes, she was only sentenced to serve 10 years in prison, the maximum sentencing allowed by Canadian law. Jasmine's specific sentence included credit for 18 months for time served, with four years to be spent in a psychiatric facility, followed by four and a half under conditional supervision in the community. In 2011, Jasmine was actually released to serve time under conditional supervision, as per her sentencing. By September of that same year, she was given a completely new identity with an unknown name so that she could live free without association to her crime and started attending university. In 2016, Jasmine's limited sentence was completed and she was fully released into the world as a civilian once more. The next case we have in store for you today is that of sweet little Mary Bell. Mary Bell was born on May 26, 1957, and raised in Newcastle-upon-Tyne, England, and lived with her mother, Betty Bell. Betty Bell was a 17-year-old worker and was often out of town when she traveled to Glasgow for work. 
Mary had never known who her biological father was, though her mother ended up marrying a man by the name of Bill Bell when Mary was very young. Mary was mostly ignored throughout her childhood, and the neglect seemed to deeply affect the way she perceived the world around her. She was known to be rather shy, reserved, and never took much interest in making proper friends in school. By the time she was 10 years old, Mary felt as though she was an outcast, with no outlet to express herself. On May 25, 1968, Mary was particularly excited as the following morning was her 11th birthday. Mary wasn't interested in receiving a specific present to celebrate her birthday. Rather, there was only one thing she wanted to do. She wanted to take a life. So, 10-year-old Mary Bell set out to do just that. In Mary's neighborhood, there was a derelict house where a four-year-old boy by the name of Martin Brown resided. She let herself into his house, and before Martin could even begin to understand what was happening, Mary already had her small hands around his neck. Within a few moments, and very little struggle from the four-year-old boy, Mary had successfully strangled Martin to death. Just like that, 10-year-old Mary became a killer. But she wasn't finished with her crime spree. Just two months later, on July 31, 1968, Mary decided to partake in another dark endeavor, accompanied by her friend Norma Joyce Bell, whom she had no familial relation to. The girls ventured into some local wasteland in the Scottswood area, where they came across a three-year-old boy named Brian Howe. Mary held Brian down and choked the boy to death, while Norma allegedly did nothing to stop it. After ensuring that Brian was dead, Mary cleaned up the crime scene to the best of her ability. The very next day, investigators ended up interviewing 1,200 children in an effort to determine new information regarding the recent deaths in town. When police interviewed Norma and Mary, they found that the two girls answered the questions in rather evasive ways, leading investigators to become increasingly more suspicious of their potential role in the crimes. When the girls went through multiple interviews, investigators found that they both changed their stories twice. Eventually, both girls ended up blaming each other for accidentally squeezing Brian's throat, but ultimately, both were arrested on August 1st. At Norma and Mary's trial in December of 1968, Norma appeared confused and guilt-stricken, which led to her being declared not guilty. Mary, however, was described by psychiatrists as displaying classic symptoms of psychopathy, and she was found guilty of manslaughter and sentenced to life imprisonment. Rather than a murder charge, Mary was found to have diminished responsibility, resulting in the lower charge of manslaughter. Mary spent eight years in various young offenders' institutes before eventually being transferred to Moore Court Open Prison. There, she actually ended up escaping alongside two other male inmates. The three escapees were at large for two whole days before all three of them were returned to their sentencing. In 1980, Mary Bell was released from prison with a new identity at the age of 23 years old. Upon her release, Mary was granted anonymity and even given a new name in order for her to be able to live a normal life. The concept of a killer is terrifying enough as it is hard for most people to fathom why someone would want to kill anyone, let alone kill multiple people. But perhaps an even more horrifying reality is the fact that age does not define a killer. It only defines their prison sentence. And when they get older, they often return to society. They may be walking among us, and we are none the wiser.